directora de la Escuela Nacional de Lenguas, Lingüística y Traducción, doctora Claudia Guadalupe García Llampayas, secretaria general de la ENALT, maestro Rodrigo Olmedo Yudico Becerril, jefe del Departamento de Lingüística Aplicada y coordinador general de este congreso, estimadas y estimados colegas de la ENALT, de otras instituciones educativas, de otras entidades de la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, de universidades nacionales y del extranjero, apreciados colegas y funcionarios de la universidad, doctor Alberto Vital, director del Centro de Enseñanza para Extranjeros de nuestra universidad. Me da mucho gusto estar el día de hoy con ustedes, con la honrosa, siempre honrosa representación de nuestro rector, el doctor Enrique Graue Vígers, que por mi conducto les envía un saludo. Creo que es muy importante que, como tantas otras actividades que ha llevado a cabo la ENALT en estos seis años, se dé continuidad a este congreso que en su primera versión inauguramos, si mal no recuerdo, en este mismo auditorio de manera presencial, que su segunda edición, por motivo de la pandemia y del confinamiento al que nos obligó, tuvo que realizarse de manera virtual. Y yo celebro que el tercer congreso que hoy estamos inaugurando se lleve a cabo en una modalidad híbrida que combine la presencialidad, como bien lo decía el maestro Olmedo, la posibilidad de un reencuentro físico con la virtualidad, que es un recurso que aprendimos a valorar en la pandemia y que nos permite llegar a públicos más amplios, a interactuar con colegas que no siempre pueden viajar y acompañarnos físicamente en estas actividades, pero que no por eso dejan de estar presentes cuando se hacen, eh, cuando, cuando, cuando actúan a través de la distancia, a través de las plataformas que nos permiten comunicarnos con ellos. Es un congreso con hondos antecedentes, como tantas otras actividades del ENALT, en el CELE, los encuentros de profesores de lenguas que se llevan a cabo de manera bianual, y este congreso también se realiza de manera bianual, y, pero permite conjuntar a las tres grandes áreas de la escuela, a la, a la enseñanza de lenguas, a la lingüística y a la traducción. Yo celebro que asistan tantos y tan reconocidos colegas de México, de otros países del mundo, que de esta manera también se dé a conocer en la excelencia académica de la Escuela Nacional de Lenguas, Lingüística y Traducción, se reafirmen sus redes de intercambio académico con otras entidades y que de esta manera también se reflexione colectivamente sobre los retos de estas tres grandes áreas, la lingüística, la enseñanza de lenguas, la traducción, la manera en la cual podemos incorporar las nuevas tecnologías, los retos que nos plantea la inteligencia artificial, la forma de llegar a públicos más amplios a través de las plataformas de, la, de comunicación a distancia, tantos temas que tienen que ver también con la didáctica de la enseñanza de las lenguas y que a final de cuentas son de la mayor importancia para trazar líneas de investigación que permitan acometer de la mejor manera los retos a los cuales nos enfrentamos y que la pandemia también ayudó a visibilizar aún más. Por todo ello, hago votos por el éxito de este congreso y pues sin más, siendo las nueve de la mañana con 58 minutos de este lune, día, lunes 31 de julio del año de 2023, es para mí un honor declarar formalmente inaugurado este tercer Congreso Internacional de Lenguas, Lingüística y Traducción. Por mi raza hablará el espíritu. Agradecemos su presencia en este auto inaugural y les invitamos a seguir las actividades del Congreso. En unos minutos daré inicio a la primera conferencia plenaria a cargo de Jean-Marc Deweyne.
No, según yo lo entendí ahorita. Y ahorita me subo. Yo sí lo necesito. A la hora que me digan. Erika, ¿a qué hora? A la hora que me digan. Are you ready? Jan Mark, are you ready? Okay, please. Buenos días a todos. Nuevamente bienvenidos a esta primera conferencia plenaria del tercer Congreso de Lenguas, Lingüística y Traducción. Es para mí un gran honor presentar a nuestro primer plenarista, al quien voy a dar lectura con su currículum para poder empezar. El título de esta plenaria es The Crucial Role of Learning and Teacher Emotions in the Foreign Language Class. Jan Mark de Vile is professor of applied linguistics and multilingualism. He has published widely on individual differences in classroom emotions. He is former president of the International Association of Multilingualism and the European Second Language Association, and current president of the International Association for the Psychology of Language Learning. He is general editor of Journal of Multilingual and Multicultural Development. He won the Equality and Diversity Research Award from the British Association for Counseling and Psychotherapy, the Robert Gardner Award for Excellence in Second Language and Bilingualism Research from the International Association of Language and Social Psychology, and the Euro SLA Distinguished Scholar Award in 2022. Please welcome Dr. DeWell. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for these uh, kind uh, introductory words. Uh, I would uh, like to thank you all, um, the, the organizing committee, for uh, thinking of me uh, as um, a plenary speaker. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, it was also for me a, a great occasion to visit uh, Mexico. Uh, it's my first visit uh, to the country. I arrived two weeks ago, and I must say that I've been blown away. Uh, by uh, the, the, the richness, the kindness, the, the beauty. Uh, and I must say that uh, the Ciudad de Mexico is, is absolutely breathtakingly, amazingly uh, beautiful. Um, and it's always uh, good to combine uh, pleasure uh, with uh, intellectual uh, pursuits. Um, so I'm going to talk to you um, about uh, a topic that I have been um, um, working on for the past 20 years. Uh, and I must say that I had never anticipated that I would work uh, and talk to you uh, today about uh, learner and teacher uh, emotions. Um, I started my academic career as a, a teacher of uh, French as a foreign language at uh, the 
Vrije Universiteit Brussel uh, in Belgium. So I was uh, French to Flemish to French as a second or third language. And I was um, a passionate language teacher. Uh, I absolutely loved being in front uh, of a classroom. Uh, and I think <clears throat> that for the, the students among you, that um, it's good to have teaching experience before thinking about uh, doing research in applied linguistics and in teaching. I think it's uh, really crucial to um, have time to observe how you function in front of a classroom and how students react to what you do. And then you can ask yourself whether what you are doing uh, is just you or whether it's part of some more general patterns. And, and, and you may notice things that maybe you hadn't noticed as a student. And one of the things I noticed was um, that my students seem to um, suffer a lot from foreign language anxiety. And not suffering from foreign language anxiety myself, I had never imagined that students could be so anxious in an oral exam. And the topic of my PhD was um, synchronic variation. I was comparing the same students in conversations with me uh, about a range of topics. And then I uh, recorded the same students during the oral exam. And I was so surprised that during oral exam, students who had been doing perfectly well uh, in uh, the classroom were really struggling uh, during the exam. And not only were they struggling, they were sweating. They were, uh, I, I, I started um, the, the exams you know, being rather naive. I had uh, a table um, and I was uh, sitting on one end of the table and they were sitting on the other end. And then I thought, why, haven't, why hasn't this student taken a shower? before coming to the exam. You know, why do I smell this student? And so I opened the window wider and I, I took my chair back. And then in the end, I added a second table, more distance, more ventilation. And it suddenly occurred to me, I smell their fear. It had never occurred to me. Uh, and so um, at the time, it was not the topic of my investigation. Uh, I did my PhD, I, I, I noticed that depending on personality and a number of social biographical uh, factors that some people seem to do better uh, at oral exams uh, than uh, others. Um, and uh, only later did I decide to investigate uh, learner emotions and more specifically uh, foreign language anxiety. Um, and so that's how we get to uh, the first slide, well, I have to define the crucial variable. Um, in this case, emotions. Um, I, I, being a linguist and not a psychologist, I had never realized that there is in fact a huge debate about definitions of um, emotions. A uh, big debate on whether emotions are universal or whether they are uh, more culture specific. And I realized that um, in uh, the kind of work that uh, I do, that it makes more sense to adopt uh, the definition that um, emotions are domain non-specific constructions of the mind. Um, they are uh, the result of socialization. Uh, they, so we don't have universal uh, emotions. Um, the only thing that is universal about emotions is that they can be situated on the dimensions of valence and arousal. So valence from positive to negative and arousal from zero activation to very high uh, activation. Okay. Um, I was very surprised when I started work uh, in uh, this uh, domain in the early 2000s that very, very few people talked uh, about uh, emotion in second language acquisition research. And I wondered why. And um, I realized that in fact, the dominant um, perspective in applied linguistics and in second language acquisition 
and I would say that this still is the dominant perspective, uh, is the cognitive perspective. So there is a, a huge amount of research on um, strategies for second language learning, uh, on the role of working memory uh, in language learning, um, but there is very little space for emotions. And I understand that, in fact, my colleagues uh, who adopt cognitive approaches think that emotions are irrational things and it's better to brush them under the carpet. Uh, and the result is that emotions, everybody knows that they exist and they are there in the classroom, but they were like the elephant in the room. Nobody wanted to talk about them. Also because it's rather difficult to measure emotions. There is, uh, it's easier to calculate um, accuracy rates or morphemes or look at written language and, and, and do corpus counts. It's harder to um, look at emotions and try and, and measure them and capture them because they are elusive and they've been uh, compared to uh, things that are irrational and hence we shouldn't, we shouldn't go there. Because if you are a second language acquisition researcher, you want to gain respect from your peers. You want to be seen to be a serious researcher. And hence, you want to stick to things that you can grasp and measure and count. I, I completely understand that. So I'm not uh, blaming the colleagues. Uh, it, it just explains why it has taken some time for interest and emotion uh, to uh, come to uh, the fore. Of course, in psychology, there's been much more work on uh, emotion, uh, especially in educational psychology, and there are some uh, references there. Um, the work around Peckroon and uh, his colleagues, where they uh, present, they talked about academic emotions, um, presented a three-dimension taxonomy, where they distinguish between valence, activation, and objective uh, focus. And then uh, over the years, uh, I have been arguing um, that emotions and uh, learner um, personality should be taken into account uh, to understand how they contribute to uh, progress and performance uh, in the foreign language. And I have repeated these calls over the years. I was really happy when Peter McIntyre uh, and colleagues in 2009 said that, yes, uh, emotions are important motivators. It was particularly nice that Peter McIntyre did the, wrote this because his PhD supervisor was Robert Gardner, who is the big name uh, in motivation research. So I thought, oh, nice. If, if the motivation researchers accept that emotion deserves more attention, then that there is a way forward. And in fact, Peter McIntyre became a, a really good friend uh, of mine. And only relatively recently did we show that how students feel is linked to their levels of emotions, um, uh, is linked to their motivation. And so uh, we use uh, Garner's um, um, uh, instrument and we correlated uh, the different um, attitude and motivation dimensions with the PANAS, which is um, an instrument that asks participants, how did you feel in the previous week? 10 positive and 10 negative emotions. And we discovered that there was a strong correlation between how students felt in the previous week and how motivated they were in their studies which is something we had not anticipated because we, we thought that motivation was a, a, a longer stable thing, but in fact, motivation it ebbs and flows, goes up and down uh, and is linked to how a person feels. It, it makes sense, but nobody had uh, checked that um, before. So um, the uh, little joke, here, of course, is that uh, I guess you know the expression in English, when pigs fly, which means never. Um, so uh, with the elephant in the room, I thought, okay, let, let's make a little pun here and say when elephants uh, fly. So the elephant is out of the room 
uh, applied linguists are getting more and more interested uh, in emotions. The fact that I'm invited here to talk about it is a good sign. Uh, it means that uh, we are getting true. And um, interestingly, in the Modern Language Journal, which is one of the top journals in applied linguistics, as you know, uh, there was very little with the word emotion uh, before uh, 2010, uh, an average of 7.6 a year. And the only emotion they talked about was anxiety. Since 2010, that number has uh, risen dramatically. And uh, we, we uh, very in, in recent years, there, there are an average of 22.5 uh, papers uh, that do mention uh, emotion. I don't know. OK, so what caused this um, interest in uh, learner emotions? Um, it was because of a paper that uh, Peter McIntyre and Tammy Gregerson published in 2012 uh, on positive psychology. And uh, they published it in uh, the <laughs> journal uh, studies, uh, SS studies in second language learning and teaching, uh, a new journal that Mirek Pavlak created in Poland. And uh, it was a journal um, that invited new kind of contributions. Because if you were a, a young researcher, you would realize that sometimes well-known published journals are not terribly interested in things that are too radically different. They typically want more of the same because they know that that will sell well. And so Peter and I submitted papers to well-established yeah, yeah, journals and they said, no, we're not interested in emotion stuff, no, no. So sometimes you need to find the right kind of journal to get the first publications out. And from there on, you can start submitting to more established journals as they catch on. Um, and positive psychology, I realize, is really what every foreign language teacher should be. I realized that I had been a positive psychologist without realizing that I was one. That if you are in front of a classroom, and it doesn't matter, in fact, it's not just for language. That if you're in front of a classroom, you need to have the belief that you can impart something useful and you need to have the belief that your students will learn something. If you don't have that belief, it won't work. So you need to have that positive attitude. Uh, and um, Peter and uh, Tammy introduced the broaden and build um, um, theory by uh, Fredrickson. Uh, who had focused specifically on learning, not specifically uh, the learning of languages, and where she pointed out that if you have positive emotions, it opens your minds. You absorb things. If you have negative emotions, if you're anxious, you will have the opposite. Uh, you will hide. You will feel threatened. You won't remember much. So the crucial point for any teaching is that your students should be positive, open their mind, and then you can teach them things. And uh, so as a teacher, you need to create that atmosphere in the classroom where your students realize that they won't be punished for making mistakes. And I remember uh, in my first, the first French class of any year, I would start, I would tell, listen, you are lucky. I'm an applied linguist. There is nothing I'm more interested in than the errors you will make in French. You will see me smile. You will see me being so happy. I might even write them down because then on the bus home, I will think, oh, where did that interesting error come from? So I won't be angry at you for making errors. It's normal. Um, the only thing I expect of you is to make slightly fewer errors towards the end of the year. And then my students would laugh and they would be relaxed. And, 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 and we, we would move on. So I think that was in fact a positive psychology take uh, on foreign language learning. And so um, in positive psychology, they do not deny that there are problems and that anxiety exists and depression exists, but instead of just focusing on the negative, they say, let's also look at the positive. So let's look at humor, let's look at flow, let's look at creativity. Um, also, let's realize that our students, they are more than containers that need to absorb linguistic knowledge from their teacher. They are people 
who need to flourish, who that need to be happy, that need to grow. Uh, and, and I think that for teacher training education, that is really a crucial, uh, a crucial point. Hello. So I talked about Peter. Uh, this is us in 2012, where we presented the first version uh, of our uh, Janus paper uh, at the AAAL conference. And um, we had been uh, working on this uh, for a, a little while. Um, we realized that we couldn't just look at anxiety, that we needed to look at the positive emotion. And so we said, what would be a positive, the positive counterpart of anxiety? And we said, well, it should be the enjoyment you have uh, in the classroom. And so uh, he was on a research leave uh, in London and we just sat down and we said, okay, let's make a scale. Uh, let's make a foreign language enjoyment scale. And so I, I think we came up with a list of 50 items uh, and then we whittled it down to the 21 best items and we asked friends and colleagues and, um, and we, we realized in fact that um, to have uh, a, a good list, we needed to have dimensions that reflected what the student, what the learner is feeling in the classroom, but also the, the people around the learner, the friends, the peers, and obviously the teacher. So the, we, we decided that these three dimensions needed to be uh, in uh, the, uh, the scale. So first we used um, uh, Elaine Horitz's uh, foreign language classroom anxiety scale. Um, and um, Elaine Horitz was a really good friend of us. She passed away uh, two years ago uh, and she was in the jury of uh, Peter McIntyre. So it, I'm saying these things because um, these are academic networks. People are linked in different ways. They are each other's uh, students, teachers, uh, and, and they, they communicate with each other. And so Elaine w was with us when we discussed these things and, and, and she was an absolutely wonderful, amazing uh, person, researcher and, and a French teacher also. So um, for enjoyment, Peter had just read uh, a book uh, by Sail Me High on Flow, 1990. And he had been very much inspired by that uh, in uh, designing this um, concept of foreign language enjoyment. Uh, so we um, defined it as a complex, positively balanced emotion with medium to high arousal, resulting from a combination of challenge and perceived ability that allows tackling difficult tasks. And uh, later on in the workshops, I will be talking about flow more specifically. That is really the, the, the topic at uh, the heart of our interest in uh, foreign language enjoyment. So you enjoy something when it is not too easy and when it is not too difficult and you are proud that you managed to do something and you did. And I think it's the same principle outside of the language class. I think it's the same if you play video games, that if you start a new video game, it's too difficult, you give up. If it's too easy and it remains too easy, you abandon it because there is no challenge. So you need to find that right balance between challenge and skill. And I guess that as a teacher, that is what you need to find uh, in the classroom. And as a learner, that is what you're looking for uh, in the classroom. Okay, so this is the 21 item scale uh, that we uh, came up with. Um, we, Real, well, we didn't realize at the point, at the time, but um, in fact, scales, participants hate it when they have to fill out very long scales. Short scales are better. Um, so we thought, okay, the first version, 21 items, that's fine. But as we started using it, we realized, oh no, we need a shorter version. So very soon, we started uh, developing uh, shorter versions uh, of this scale. And uh, this is the, the current version of the scale that we developed uh, with uh, Eloise Botes, who is a postdoc uh, at the uh, University of Luxembourg, um, where we distinguish between three um, 
dimensions of foreign language enjoyment. You can get a score for foreign language enjoyment, but you can also get uh, the score for personal enjoyment, for teacher appreciation, and for social enjoyment. And so um, Eloise Botes is an amazing uh, statistician uh, and psychometric specialist. So she, she designed this uh, following the, the rules. Um, I also have, I, I must say that being in London is a wonderful place to do research because I have uh, PhD students from all over the world. Uh, I also have lots of Chinese students. Uh, and um, well, one of them, uh, Chen Chen Li, developed uh, this Chinese version uh, of our uh, enjoyment scale. So you have to believe me. Uh, well, if you know Chinese, you can tell me if, if, if some of the translation is wrong. Um, I don't think so, but you never know. So in the Janus paper with Peter, what we wanted to find out was whether anxiety and enjoyment were opposite ends of the same dimension, or whether they were in fact independent uh, emotions. And what we discovered was that they are negatively correlated, but that the correlation isn't very strong, which means that they are in fact independent dimensions meaning that if you enjoy the class, you will typically be less anxious. But it is, in fact, perfectly possible for you to be both anxious and enjoy it. Typically, moments where you have to present something in front of the class, that your heart starts beating fast. You, 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 you think, oh, God, I'm, I'm feeling so anxious. But I enjoy this because, you know, everybody is looking at me. I have the intention of the class. And so those are brief moments where you have both emotions simultaneously at a very high level. And then in fact, you can have an absence of both emotions. You can feel not anxious at all, but be totally bored and not enjoy it at all. So it, it, it's possible to have different combinations of these two emotions. So there is no seesaw relationship. And that's important for a teacher because it, the teacher needs to realize that pushing anxiety down will not necessarily push an enjoyment up. Um, and, and that's really a crucial pedagogical um, insight. Um, and what we discovered, uh, we collected data from 1,746 participants, foreign language learners from all over the world. And what we noticed is that um, at the lower end, those who were at low intermediate level, um, they reported more enjoyment and anxiety. But as people get more advanced, their enjoyment goes up and their anxiety goes down. And I would love to test this in, for, for different activities. I would say for, because I, I love doing karate. When I started doing karate, I had enjoyment in doing it, but I was very anxious of getting hurt. And so um, my enjoyment and anxiety levels were pretty close. And as I got uh, more advanced, my anxiety dropped and my enjoyment went up. I would say it's probably the same if you have a child uh, learning to play violin, that, you know, at the start they will be afraid that everybody will run away when they start playing the, their instrument. And that as they get better at it, they realize that people actually enjoy listening to them. And so their anxiety will go down, their enjoyment will go up. So this is a pretty uh, typical uh, pattern. Um, we had, it was a mixed method study. So we had open questions. We asked participants uh, to describe us an episode in their foreign language class where they experienced strong enjoyment. And they described activities that were typically uh, empowering them, that gave them a certain degree of autonomy, um, that uh, allowed them to be creative, to bond. They also mentioned episodes where they got praise from peers, from teachers, um, and, and where there was a, a general atmosphere with humor and, and mutual trust and respect. Here is an example, um, Simona, uh, who describes this episode of having to talk to her colleagues uh, in, in class, how she felt a bit nervous and her heart was pounding, but it was great standing there 
expressing my opinion and knowing that all the other students are listening to you to, uh, with attention. So this was obviously somebody who would become a teacher herself. Um, and then we started looking at sources uh, of uh, enjoyment. Uh, we discovered that older learners reported more enjoyment. Our female participants reported more enjoyment. Uh, also, people with higher levels of multilingualism reported more enjoyment. Uh, that enjoyment is also linked to how advanced you are in the learning of the foreign language, um, your relative standing in the group. So if you feel that you are just average, that's okay. If you are below average, you typically don't enjoy the class that much. If you are above average, you enjoy the class uh, much more. And, and obviously, if you get good test results and, and, and the teacher praises you, that's also linked to uh, higher levels of uh, enjoyment. And then we realize that um, enjoyment can also derive from sources that are not just learner internal, but are a combination of learner internal and learner external uh, variables, such as attitude towards the culture, um, the effect of the specific teacher, that if you have two teachers, there might be one teacher that you like more, where you experience more enjoyment than the other one. Um, might be an effect of school, and there might be an effect of societal context, namely, how is the language uh, perceived by that specific group? So I, I pity the um, foreign language teachers of Russian these days, because it's, it's not a popular uh, language right now, and it's beyond their control, obviously. Um, so here are some uh, a study on the predictors of enjoyment uh, in uh, China, um, English foreign language learners. And as you see, uh, the strongest uh, predictor of uh, enjoyment was uh, attitudes towards the teacher. So if you like the teacher, you will enjoy the class. Uh, whereas for anxiety, it, attitudes towards the teacher uh, was a significant predictor, but predicted very little variance. So there is a clear difference here between enjoyment and anxiety and the predictors of them. Um, so here, looking at uh, the sources of uh, enjoyment, uh, this was um, uh, uh, with interviews and thematic uh, analysis. Um, so you see uh, most comments were to do with the teacher. So we realized that enjoyment is really linked to the teacher. Anxiety is much more learner internal. Some learners are by nature more anxious and the teacher can't do much about it. Um, and then we, uh, be, because um, during the introduction there was a brief mention of the pandemic uh, and how we were all suddenly forced to switch to emergency uh, remote teaching, uh, to online teaching. And um, it was, I mean, it worked. Uh, but it wasn't quite as enjoyable. Um, and if the teachers among you, I, I would love to share your opinions, but uh, talking to your screen uh, and to, you know, everybody turned their camera off and, and you could only look your, at, at yourself. And uh, it was pretty, you needed more self-motivation uh, to uh, remain positive uh, than in, in, an, uh, in a classroom. And so what we discovered was that, um, Enjoyment dropped significantly uh, in the online classes, um, and that anxiety dropped significantly, but not that much. Uh, and we think that the drop in anxiety was because students could hide. They turned their camera off, they could turn the volume down, so the teacher didn't suddenly appear behind them or in front of them, yelling at them, so they were pretty safe. So in, it, in fact, it meant that the online teaching was um, emotionally disembodied. It was emotionally distant. Everything was further away. Um, and, and as a teacher, you could not control um, the environment that the student was in because you didn't know whether the student was also listening to the radio or talking with friends or having a beer or, or doing things that they wouldn't typically do uh, in a classroom. Uh, we found the same thing for uh, Arab and Kurdish. Uh, foreign language learners, um, they, their enjoyment went down in the online condition, 
their boredom went up significantly uh, and their anxiety also went down uh, slightly. Um, well, well, one of the first studies where we um, looked at the effect of uh, the teacher was a, a study that I did uh, with a couple of colleagues and also with my daughter in 2018. Uh, we collected data from two London uh, secondary schools and um, we discovered that uh, enjoyment is totally linked to teacher, anxiety is totally not linked to the teacher. And being a proud dad, I obviously can't help but include a picture of my daughter who went to study French and linguistics uh, in Oxford. Um, and we um, wrote a couple of papers together, which was really fun. I had never anticipated writing papers with one's child would be that much fun. Although I must tell you, and I don't know if some of you have that experience, your child can be cruel. So. So my daughter who grew up with uh, French, English and Dutch as first languages, who always went to English speaking schools, she would say things like, ah, oh, Papa, ton English n'est pas bon. So she would, she would correct my English and say, no, no, that preposition doesn't, nah, no, nah, ah, oh, Papa, ah. Oh. So, but, but it was so much fun uh, doing it with her. Um, and uh, so we um, ran a pseudo uh, longitudinal design uh, we compared three different age groups and we discovered that in fact uh, anxiety didn't change over time that enjoyment dipped for the group of 14 15 year olds probably because they were being prepared for the gcse exams um, that is a national exam in the uk that you have to pass at 16 and teachers and schools are absolutely obsessed with the results and so they teach to the test. So I, I think that's probably the reason why enjoyment dropped uh, at that time. What we discovered was in fact that the predictors of enjoyment and anxiety changed uh, in these three age groups. So the youngest ones, enjoyment was linked to the peers. Uh, and for the two oldest groups, um, linked enjoyment was linked to the teacher, uh, whereas anxiety was linked to the self in the first uh, two age groups and to the peers uh, for the 16 to 18 year olds. So although on the surface, not much changed, in fact, the, the sources of enjoyment and anxiety changed over time. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Chen Chen Li, uh, who came to uh, do, or I was her second uh, supervisor um, for her PhD. Um, and she um, got really interested in boredom. Uh, apparently, well, it's a, we all know that it can be a problem uh, in foreign language classes. Uh, in China, it's apparently also um, a, a problem that teachers have to deal with. And so she um, um, defined, or, or we defined in, in a paper, uh, boredom as a, a negative emotion with very low degree of activation uh, arising from ongoing activities that are either too challenging or not challenging enough. So you get bored because you can't do it or because you've already done it so many times and, and, and you, 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 you can't get um, interested in, in it anymore. So teachers need to avoid too much repetition and make uh, the uh, class um, appropriately difficult. Um, we developed a scale uh, and I have used the, the first factor of that scale for different classes. Um, and um, we looked then at sources of uh, enjoyment and boredom. And as you see, most of the sources of enjoyment are also sources of boredom in the other direction. So if you love your teacher, then you will enjoy the class and you won't be bored. Um, same if you have a positive attitude towards the, the foreign language or the foreign language culture. And then uh, looking at uh, the effect of teacher variables, uh, we found that teachers who are enthusiastic, uh, predictable and friendly, that their, their students would report more enjoyment and less boredom. And then um, we also got interested in short-term fluctuations in enjoyment, anxiety, and boredom. 
And this is um, a study that is uh, coming out uh, in December, um, where we measured these three emotions in five classes. Um, and we discovered that there was some variation, uh, especially in class three, which happened to be taught by a different teacher. So students had their regular teachers, uh, their regular teacher in class one, two, four, and five, and class three was a replacement teacher. And, and some of the students didn't like the replacement teacher very much. And so they reported a drop uh, in uh, enjoyment linked to the teacher. And then with uh, Kazia Saito, uh, another lovely friend of mine uh, from uh, University College London, uh, we collected data with Florentina uh, Halimi in Kuwait uh, over one uh, semester. Uh, we collected data four times. We discovered that there was no change in enjoyment and anxiety. It remained uh, stable, um, but that there was a significant drop in motivation over time. And, and we had not expected to find that. We thought that motivation would be more stable than the learner uh, emotions. Um, and uh, we also looked at the effect of teacher behaviors on the emotions. And we discovered that um, teachers who weren't joking much in class, that at the start, it had no effect on levels of enjoyment. But over time, students who had teachers that weren't joking enjoyed the class less and less and less. And now, this is an interesting um, observation for research methods. Um, if you are a master student or a PhD student, listen to me. It's always dangerous to, um, to assume causality. In this specific uh, case, it is perfectly possible that the teacher who wasn't joking much was a bad teacher and that the cause for the drop in enjoyment had nothing to do with the teacher not joking much, but maybe the teacher was authoritarian, or was overly strict, didn't know his stuff well, didn't love the language much, didn't connect with the students well. And, and typically, if you are a good teacher, then you joke. It, it's, it's just one of the aspects of being a good teacher, right? It, so it, it's um, always, um, important not to jump to easy conclusions and to assume causality. It, it's usually more complex. And since we didn't have any uh, classroom observation, we, we, we had to be very careful uh, in uh, interpreting that result. Um, oh, yes, this is a, a, a paper that came out last month uh, with a former master student of mine, Rashid Mefta. We collected data from 502 Moroccan EFL learners. And um, what we uh, discovered was that um, motivation remained high from beginners to intermediate to advanced EFL learners. So this is, again, a pseudo-longitudinal design. We collected data once. We differentiated the people who identified themselves as beginners, intermediates, and advanced. And because they had all been studying English in Morocco, we assume that they reflected change over time. And because you cannot follow a student from age 12 to 18 or from age 8 to 18 if they study English. So, so this is, in fact, the only practical alternative to see change over time. And as you see, there was an increase in positive emotions over time. Uh, that stabilized at the intermediate level, and a drop in negative emotions over time that, again, more or less started stabilizing uh, at the um, intermediate uh, level. And one of the emotions that we had included also was a foreign language peace of mind. And I think I have um, a slide on that. Yes, here it is. Um, it's a Chinese, well, it's an emotion that comes from the Chinese tradition. Uh, it's linked to Confucius. Uh, if you know something about um, Eastern Chinese uh, philosophy, uh, the importance is not so much the focus on the individual, but on the community. It's not so much on 
um, individual satisfaction and high arousal and excitement. It's about being in harmony with your, with your family, with your community. And hence this concept of uh, peace of mind spoke uh, to me. Um, and um, we, we, we published a paper with the Li Ju, uh, who's now uh, in Hong Kong, where we developed uh, this uh, new scale. And um, what we discovered was that foreign language peace of mind in the Chinese context was a better predictor than foreign language enjoyment. And I thought, wow, that's great. And so we thought, okay, let's see whether this Chinese concept applies to different cultures. And so we, we, we repeated, we included it in our uh, Moroccan sample and we discovered that yes, peace of mind is an important predictor in uh, the Moroccan context, which is quite different from the Chinese context. So I'm, I'm now collecting data from different places in the world to see whether foreign language peace of mind uh, may have uh, an effect. And so this is a schematic, a schematic representation of these four emotions. So foreign language peace of mind is a positive uh, emotion, but it's uh, low in activation compared to enjoyment that is positive, but higher in activation with boredom and anxiety being negative emotions uh, with both low and higher levels of activation. Um, and then uh, with the Chen Chen Li, again, we discovered that Emotions are really a dynamic, complex system. They are all linked to each other. Students are experiencing multiple emotions simultaneously. They are changing uh, and shaping each other. Uh, teacher enthusiasm pushes up uh, student enjoyment, pushes down their boredom, and that will then push up their engagement. So it's really a huge network of variables and, and that's why I would say there is no easy recipe to be a good language teacher. It's not just one thing. You need to do like 20 different things simultaneously. I, I think uh, good teachers are like magicians. Uh, it's not pushing one button. There is not a single recipe. Sometimes something that always works won't work for some reason. And I think um, I see some of you nodding. Um, it's one of these puzzling things that as a teacher, you know, you do something, you know that this works and suddenly it doesn't. And you think, what's wrong with me? Why aren't they laughing? Why aren't they smiling? Why do they seem to have a hangover? Until you realize that they do have a hangover because there was a party last night and, and they all got very drunk and got to bed very late and they, they like you, so they did turn up for class at 9 a.m., but in fact, they should rather be in bed. And, and, and so you realize it's not your fault. So sometimes it doesn't work. And, and I think as a teacher, you, you need to accept that, that you, you can't control everything. Uh, and then um, a, another study where we looked at um, uh, the effect of different uh, teacher uh, variables. Um, now, one interesting difference between Western and Asian cultures is that uh, in Western cultures, um, students love teachers that are a, a little bit unpredictable. In Arab and Eastern cultures, it's the opposite. They love teachers who are perfectly predictable. And, and I don't have an easy answer to that. I, I'd be happy to speculate about it, but it's an interesting difference. Um, uh, however, what they love in all cultures is that the teacher uses the target language. So if the teacher uses the target language a lot, there will be higher levels of uh, enjoyment. There won't be any more anxiety, but, but it's, a, it's a significant uh, predictor. And then uh, in, in the end, obviously, they will have more positive attitudes and all this will lead to um, better performance and higher uh, achievement. Uh, this is the very impressive um, Leighton, uh, the structural equation modeling that Eloise Botes is uh, absolutely brilliant with, and it just shows you that, unfortunately, anxiety was the strongest negative predictor of um, uh, academic achievement, uh, with boredom the second strongest negative predictor, and we had hoped that enjoyment would be a strong predictor, but it didn't. And I think that's also one of the lovely things in research 
you can have good hypotheses, you can hope to find something and you have strong expectations and then the results, I mean, some, sometimes you get disappointed. You think, oh, I wish the result had been different. But, but I mean, that's the pleasure about research. You never know what you will find. And so uh, here again, uh, you can see that um, the effects of boredom on uh, Chinese EFL learners, uh, the, the, the teacher plays a, a crucial uh, effect. Now, um, the argument finally to conclude, um, does it matter? Do emotions matter? Um, and if you are in a conversation with cognitive um, uh, applied linguists, they will tell you, you know, wouldn't it be more interesting to focus on, say, learner strategies? Yeah, we know that that has an effect. Say, so, okay, well, one way to convince you is to run a meta-analysis of studies that looked at the relationship between learner emotions and their performance or their willingness to communicate. And so we did that. And uh, what we found was that students, uh, studies that found uh, a relationship between enjoyment and willingness to communicate, it was systematic. And it was a, a strong uh, correlation of uh, 0.44. So students who enjoy themselves they will communicate more. And we all know that more communication will lead to a stronger uh, performance. Alors, je me perds. No. Yes. So when we uh, ran uh, the analysis, uh, the meta-analysis, uh, we found um, a moderate positive correlation of 0.36 between enjoyment and academic achievement. So students who enjoy themselves get better scores at the end. So you, can't, you cannot wave that away and say, well, it doesn't matter what they feel. It does. Uh, and if you look at the relationship between anxiety and achievement, it's a moderate negative correlation, uh, minus uh, 0.39. So it means students who are anxious don't do as well um, and don't progress as well and then don't perform as well. So it does matter. We need to look at uh, how uh, students feel. So to conclude, um, I think we can say that learners' emotions are the driving force uh, in foreign language classes. They are both affecting their performance and affected by. Um, Teachers can create optimal positive classroom climate to allow students to enjoy themselves and to flourish. I didn't talk about um, teacher emotions uh, in this talk. It would be a different talk, but obviously the teacher emotions matter too, because if the teacher is standing in front of the class and is clearly um, unwilling to teach and unhappy and totally depressed, then everybody will feel totally depressed and unhappy. So if as if the teacher on stage is the actor and needs to fake happiness if necessary to make sure that the, the students uh, get along and, and get enthusiastic. Uh, I, I remember once I, I was um, in my first year of teaching and I was love sick. Uh, and I was, I was feeling terribly depressed. And, and why didn't she love me? And she had this other guy and I was depressed, depressed, depressed. And I would enter the classroom and then I would suddenly remember, oh no, I can't be depressed in front of my students. So I, I pretended that I was perfectly happy. And so I was happy for an hour um, and then I left the classroom and suddenly by in going out of the classroom, suddenly it, it got back to me. So, oh yeah, I'm depressed or why doesn't she love me? Why doesn't she love me? So, so I, I think that, that you, you realize that um, as a teacher, how much, that in fact, you need to control your emotions in order to control the emotions of your students. That's the key to it. And I also realize that that is the key to karate, that in order to be a good martial artist, you need to control your emotions, meaning you cannot show anger, um, you cannot show despair, you cannot show frustration, you cannot start yelling at your students or at your opponent, you need to be in control. 
And I think that, in fact, it would be good for teacher training to have some martial arts, uh, not for the physical side. Well, maybe, I don't know, but for the psychological side, because very often you have students who try to test your authority, right? They may try to undermine you. You need to be really, really psychologically strong and positive to be able to handle that. And there is a lot of interesting research on teacher vulnerability, um, on the strategies that, teacher, that teachers can use um, to um, uh, do emotional labor in class, to pretend to be happy, have that smile on their face. Uh, and and it's, it, it's intense. Uh, it, it's, you, if you are a teacher, you know that you can be totally knackered after a class. It's such a physical exercise. You need to get all these people together and lead them uh, to the destination. Uh, it, it's, it's marvelous when it works, but it is hard work. And if you're a student and you haven't done that yet, you know, it's exhilarating. It's fantastic, but it is hard work. We do deserve a little holiday after that. Uh, I will conclude on that. Here, uh, no, conclude. References. Thank you. Muchas gracias, doctor. Eh, ahora procedemos, tenemos cinco minutos para preguntas. Si alguien tiene una pregunta, por favor, levantar la mano y nuestras edecanes pasarían, nuestras anfitriones pasarían. Acá, por favor. Si nos gustan decir eh, de dónde nos acompañan y su nombre, por favor. Sí, buenas tardes. Eh, buenos días todavía. Aide Silva, de la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras de la UNAM. Bonjour, merci de votre conférence. Je profite du fait que vous parlez français pour euh, le faire en français. Ahorita lo digo en español brevemente. Eh, J'ai trouvé votre conférence très intéressante parce qu'effectivement, c'est un sujet qui, est, qui a été traité de manière relativement tardive, mais qui maintenant est de plus en plus présent. Et étant donné que vous avez cité Six and Me Highly, je voudrais savoir si dans le cadre de vos nombreuses recherches, vous avez eu l'occasion de traiter spécifiquement la question du jeu, puisque à la fin, vous avez parlé aussi de karaté. Et finalement, la question du jeu est aussi une question euh, qui associe le contrôle des émotions, de savoir gagner, savoir perdre, etc. Et donc, je lui remercie, bien sûr, pour sa pour conférence et lui ai demandé que tant a tenu l'opportunité ou non de travailler en torno au jeu, qui aussi implique les émotions dans la classe. Mm. Merci. Je pense que le crucial key, ce qui est key, c'est really, que uh, si um, vous get vos étudiants à jouer, or to play games, or it turns their attention away from, oh, I might be making a mistake. Because suddenly they need to have authentic communication with their peers to make the play work. And I think that the, the key to enjoyment is to make the students forget that they are in a classroom and that they should be talking about authentic things that matter to them and by creating games, that, that's a good way to um, org, well, uh, create the opportunity for them to do that. So, so I think I, I love games uh, in, in classes. It's a great idea. We, we, we haven't, I, I don't think anyone has yet studied the specific, that would be a great PhD topic. Muchas <laughs> gracias. <laughs> Thank you. Well, actually, it's two questions. Three weeks ago, I had my presentation at the research colloquium in my PhD, and I talked pretty much about all of these things because you've been my guide through all of my research. You know that for the emails I've sent you. And one of the comments that I received was that how current is this topic? Because there is a lot of research. Well, that's what my coordinator told me. There's a lot of research between emotions and learning in general. So the first question for you is, which would you say are the specific differences between language learning and general learning regarding uh, positive emotions? Yeah, I, I think the crucial thing, and any language teacher will know that, is that in a foreign language class, you can have students talk about their inner feelings that is impossible in any other class. You, you, your inner feelings don't matter in the history class or the maths class or... or it, you can talk about them in the foreign language class. 
And I think you can also talk about your feelings in a foreign language because um, it doesn't have as much emotional resonance. Uh, and because your peers are not your family members, they are not necessarily your best friends. So you may disclose things to your peers in the in a foreign language classroom that you wouldn't disclose anywhere else. And very often I was a bit scared when my foreign language class turned into a, a group therapy class where people started disclosing really personal information that I thought, woo, I'm not a psychotherapist, we, sh should we go there? But, but it, they, the students considered that this was a safe place to talk about these things that really matter to them. And I was thinking, okay, what matters to me is that they are doing this in the foreign language. And as long as some boundaries are respected, I, we, we can go further than anywhere else. So I think that's why being a foreign language teacher is also such a rewarding experience. I think you get, I got more uh, reward from teaching French than from teaching linguistics uh, in a way. O although, uh, I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, of course. And well, the, the other one is a comment that I received in a presentation in another space in which they told me right now, I think not only in Mexico, but around the world, there is a misunderstanding about the concept of happiness and positivity. And they told me, teacher, don't you think that positive feelings are overrated? Like everyone's talking about positive feelings in the classroom and ignoring the negative ones. What would you respond to that? Oh, no, no. You should not um, ignore the negative ones. The whole point about positive psychology is that we shouldn't just focus and obsess about the things that go wrong and about deficits. And I think that's the crucial element in a foreign language class because your learners will have deficits. So don't obsess about the deficits, but obviously don't pretend that there aren't deficits because there, there are gaps, they are there to learn. Um, the, it's just having a perspective that it's okay not to be perfect, that we learn by trial and error. And that hence, you know, you make mistakes, I will correct you, but I will never humiliate you because you make a mistake. You are safe in this space. And, and as a teacher, I'm in, interested in you as a person. You are not a machine that is there to absorb information. I'm interested in you. And I think that students very quickly realize, oh, the, teachers, the teacher pays attention to what I say. The teacher listens to me. And, and I think that's really the key to any successful teaching. Thank you very much. Uh, just, just a brief question. I am Radina Dimitrova. I teach Chinese and Chinese-Spanish translation here mm -hmm. at Enalt. And I was very interested that you have had the opportunity to uh, like analyze the reactions and the feelings of Chinese students abroad when mm -hmm. they're exposed to a, a foreign culture and a foreign way of teaching. While living in China, I was teaching English and, and Spanish, and a lot of the things like coincide with what you found out. But it does uh, some of your research also uh, like uh, see exactly? Uh, do, does it focus on expectations? What are the expectations of Chinese students? How do we, how do they understand enjoyment in the first place? Because really, in China, um, like all the teaching process is not focused on enjoyment. Mm -hmm. at all so uh have you found like uh the the when they're exposed to a foreign culture and foreign way of teaching how the their own perceptions and expectations change over the time uh, does some of your articles focus on this specifically thank you sure um in fact uh, chen chen li and and my chinese colleagues who have worked on this they say oh enjoyment exists everywhere around the world you know students enjoy or not enjoy themselves but as you say, absolutely, it depends on, on the culture and on cultural expectations and things that are enjoyable in one culture might not necessarily be felt to be uh, enjoyable in another culture. Um, I, I think um, it, typical in Western classrooms, uh, students know that they can be expected to do something alone in front of the class. That's something that the Chinese really, really hate. I, I think the Western students probably don't love it that much either. But, but um, so I, I, um, 
I think a lot depends also on who the teacher is, because if you were teaching English uh, and Spanish in China, then you obviously were not a Chinese. So it meant that the expectations of the students in your classroom, they would realize, okay, this is a foreigner. So, so we have to expect, we, she will do unexpected things. And maybe they will realize that, well, sometimes it's good to try something unexpected, you know, just like you taste a cuisine that you have ne never tasted before. Um, well, you, 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 you taste this teacher who does weird things and you realize, well, oh, okay, well, I don't like it that much, but I can see it. Um, maybe after a while you get used to it and you think, well, you know, this foreign teacher isn't that bad. Um, and and it, it, it kind of pushes you to be a little bit more open-minded. And I think that that is, in fact, also a crucial thing in any classroom, that we should shake um, away the prejudices that students have about what is right and what is wrong, about what is, you know, their own cultural value. And they need to realize that there are people out there that cook differently, speak differently, have totally different worldviews, and that they don't need to be convinced that these other views are the correct ones, but that there are a diversity of views. And I think that's also where multilingualism and multiculturalism comes in, that learning a foreign language makes you realize, wow, there are people who have a word uh, for an emotion that is untranslatable in my first language. How interesting is that? We can have a conversation on this, and, and, and this is very enriching. And I think everybody would agree that that is enriching. And it's not about converting people to different worldviews. It's just making them aware that in other places in the world, people have very different opinions on this and that as a teacher, you are respectful. That's all. Bueno, muchas gracias. Tendremos que agradecemos a nuestra audiencia en YouTube y, empezamos, y agradecemos al profesor de Well. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you.